Yo, what is going on, y'all? I know that after that wild episode that everyone has questions and is looking for answers. I got you covered. Otto lost his position as the hand to the tongue. I mean, to Sir Kristen. This is like losing your job to the intern who only makes coffee. But now he's running the whole office. Plus, Blood getting caught and snitching faster than Takashi 6 9 at a parole hearing? I mean, yo, come on, man. At least make it challenging. And not to mention everything that happened with Rhaenyra and Damon having it out. Thankfully, I've had time. I had actual time to view this episode several times. And we're going to be able to go into all the little details of the episode together and point out some of the things that you might have missed. But all right, folks, look. I hate to be that guy, but here we are. You know the drill. Like the video, subscribe, do all the things that help me not have to get a real job. The last video got a thousand plus views, but the video only got like 36 likes. Please give this video a like if you like the content. Seriously, my mom is starting to drop hints about my old room being available again. Anyway, we start off with the aftermath of Blood and Cheese's actions. King Aegon so mad, he wrecks Viserys' model set of King's Landing. That's like your kid smashing your Lego Death Star because you wouldn't buy them ice cream. But this moment right here with Aegon wrecking the model set is symbolic in that this act definitely shows that he's washed away any last vestige of Viserys' influence on his disposition on his sister. We then switch to see that Aemon pieces together the clues like Batman in Arkham Knight. But let's be real. Amon's detective skills are more Scooby-Doo than Sherlock Holmes, but he does figure out that Blood and Cheese came in through his room looking for him. And when they didn't find him, they stole his money. We then switch to Allison with her emotionally deaf father, Otto, who rambles about how this is only a minor inconvenience and whatnot. And Allison is all like, what the F are you talking about? <laughs> What's wild is that Otto's all about strategy, but he's missing the emotional impact. Seriously, even Siri shows more concern. My guy has been manipulating Allison her whole life and gives absolutely no Fs about how she feels about it. And he's not about to start now. He tells Allison to man up and get ready to fight back. We then switch to see Aegon throwing a tantrum at the small council meeting. It's like watching a spoiled kid lose it at Chuck E. Cheese because they ran out of pizza. Someone get this man a Snickers. What's messed up is that he never wanted to be king. He never wanted the responsibility. He didn't want a sister wife. And now look what happened. Then homeboy starts going off on Sir Kristen when he asks him where he was at. And Sir Kristen was like, a bed. Really? <laughs> a bed? That's the new slang now? Yo, I'm gonna try that. Honey, let's go a bed. <laughs> you wish me luck. Sir Kristen, though, he gets a funny reaction from Aegon, who, in my opinion, had every right to be head the head of security when something like this happened. Like, now is the time when he should be justified in going full <laughs> Joffrey on his staff for a failure of this magnitude. His son? <laughs> Yo, I kind of want to start a tantrum for them on this one. And it's in this moment that it's pretty clear that Aegon has no idea that Sir Kristen is knocking boots with his moms because if he knew this, this moment would have played out way differently. Instead, he guilt trips the hell out of Sir Kristen, who, despite being terrible at his job, really does think highly of his job. And he's definitely disappointed in himself as the primary person responsible for the safety of the king and his family. And Allison shuts the F up. Like, she shuts all the way up. The most she can do for homeboy is give him that look of consolation, like, I, uh, I got you later if, you know, Aegon lets you keep your head. The only thing that saves Sir Kristen, hell, the only thing that saved pretty much everyone in this room right here is the fact that they actually caught the dude blood because, yo, Allison was next. She, she was about to get it. But once we hear that they actually caught homeboy, we see that Aegon, like the half-decent dad that he is, 
immediately wants to put hands on a dude. Expeditiously. He don't care about strategy. He don't care about political moves. He don't get care about getting information. None of that. He said it's time to fight back. And he don't like the fact that nobody else is getting hyped with him. And in that moment, you know, I kind of feel him too. Like, nobody else is hyped. Nobody? Right before Aegon starts beheading people, we hear Otto come through and Tywin his way out of the situation by telling the king what to do by giving the baby, Jaehaerys, a public funeral. And I gotta admit that Tywin might have been a high tower because the way my guy Rice Ifens is playing this is giving me full-on Tywin vibes. And I kind of like how the show is doing that with the parallels with this show and the OG Game of Thrones right down to the king's mom also being in on it. The next scene we see Allison tell Helena about the plan and it's in this moment that I notice just how much this girl Fizz Sabin who's playing Helena has been acting acting like I know I kind of dismissed her in the first episode but paying attention to this scene and looking back at last episode I'm noticing how everyone else in the scene is kind of acting around her like there are moments when I see actors and they get in the zone either with their dialogue or their physical performance and the rest of the cast does their best to just keep up and i'm not saying that you know fia is acting circles around everyone but i am saying that she does steal scenes and moments here and there and is elevating the storytelling with her performance even this scene with her on the horse carriage she shines but yeah <laughs> Yo, oh, that's <laughs> Yo, this must be a mother blood fucking wreck. <laughs> Yo, this guy snitches faster than Takashi69 at a parole hearing. It's like he got a frequent flyer card for betrayal. Does Restoros have a snitches club? Because this man must be a card carrying member. Like the first men must be rolling in their graves for this one. Like even before Sir Laris can even sit down. <laughs> like it actually got in the rope. He was just walking in and getting situated. <laughs> and this motherfucking bucket told him everything. He told him who, he told him what, where, when, why, a little bit of how. <laughs> like he told him everything. <laughs> okay all right i'm gonna edit this out okay okay i'm back so read that i'm sorry he told him everything before he even got situated and then as soon as he did it, the king comes through like a good dad and plays stickball with this dude's head. But then House of the Dragon messes me up because they turn around and show us the body of Jaehaerys as they carriage him through town for his Targaryen cremation funeral. And here they go again doing the parallels thing again, right? Because the funeral procession is like Cersei's walk of shame, but with hay instead of insults. I got to admit that I kind of like how House of the Dragon does this for us Game of Thrones fans and the way they do it here is different enough but just as effective as how it was done in Game of Thrones with the crowd throwing hay at her. We then switch to Rhaenyra back in Driftmark in shock that they dare accuse her of the death of Jaehaerys. That they dare suggest that she is capable of something so vile. And I love how Rhaenys is always the first one to figure stuff out. She looks right at Damon, and this mofo looks damn near smug, like, eh, hey? But I, I like how Rhaenys has been, you know, throughout both seasons, pretty freaking wise on what's going on, right? When Rhaenyra figures it out, Damon seems to give little fucks, and Rhaenyra decides that now is the time to call him out on his BS. Damon hides his ambition worse than a kid trying to sneak cookies. Dude, like, we see you. You've got crumbs all over your face and a head in the cookie jar. We see you. We then see Rhaenyra ask her stepdaughter to take her dragon and fly to King's Landing. And Rhaenyra sending Bela to King's Landing is like that, not my kids meme. Like, she's all, not my son. 
Mm -mm, but you go ahead, sweetheart. <laughs> Next, we see Damon, dressed for war. Running away from his problems. We then switch to Aegon, finally see his wife Helena on those big steps. And my guy is fresh, he's clean after taking care of blood. He ain't got time for that. We then switch to see Rhaenyra playing with her kids that she had with Damon. Them Targaryens, they some fertile motherfuckers. Anyway, the show keeps things moving and we switch back to Kristen and Alicent with Kristen letting his guilt of getting caught slipping make him feel like he actually needs to do his job. Kind of like, you know, becoming a better father since Kendrick. Alicent ain't got time for that and just takes a bath by herself. We then switch to see Sir Kristen decide he's got time to bother Sir Aaron while my man is just trying to eat. He lets Eric know that he's in a heady mood by picking on his cake. Eric tries to get out of there, but before he can, Kristen lets him know that not only is he in a petty mood, but he also has more time. Ain't nothing worse than a petty person who has time. And Kristen's projecting his guilt like a bad movie on a 90s projector. It's fuzzy, shaky, and nobody really wants to see it. Eric is on the receiving end and gets sent on a mission to impersonate his twin Eric and kill Rhaenyra. We did see a cool moment with Jaceris and his sister wife reminiscing about his dad's for a second. You know, it's like a Targaryen version of a Hallmark movie, except with incest and death. But also shout out to this show for the way they just up the diversity and inclusion compared to its predecessor but they manage to avoid the kind of backlash that shows like Star Wars gets when they do it by countering it with actual good writing. Amazing how that works. We then switch to see Amon with a motherly prostitute, naked, getting a therapy session from her as we find out that she's among the few beings on this earth helping keep Amon in check. We then switch to see the Meadowsmith dude Hugh from last episode who we saw in the throne room petitioning the king for an advance on his pay. And I'm just now figuring out that we're going to be seeing more of this guy than I thought. Apparently the king hasn't paid him yet, his daughter is sick, and his wife is skeptical. We then switch to see my guy Alan of Hull meeting up with his brother with plans of tearing into some goat. And yo, bonus points to House of his Dragon for putting that in the script, right? Because I could only imagine that the script probably had something else like mutton, right? And some one of the dudes on the set was like, nah, mutton, put some gold. And they was like, all right, go with it, <laughs> you know? Anyway, we see that Alan is back and has a brother here whom he loves dearly. They go back and forth on Alan's next step with Lord Corliss, and it seems like Alan is ready for retirement. We then switch to see Pillow talk about Damon, a Rhaenyra's drama, and I hope, I hope, hope people mean the hell out of this moment, right? Because this moment right here with a husband and wife laying in bed laughing at other people's problems, this is the stuff I love. We then switch to see Miseria having some one-on-one -on -one time with Rhaenyra, and Rhaenyra wants to know what the White Worm did to help Damon in his schemes. Miseria is mostly honest and tells her that she only helped Damon in order to earn back her freedom. What she didn't know was that Damon flew away and left town before actually freeing her. What's even more tragic is when Rhaenyra actually remembers her former auntie and realizes just how effed up her uncle husband is. The White Worm convinces her that she'll actually be loyal to Rhaenyra and reminds us of Rhaenys when she mentions how she learned that the men of King's Landing will never allow a woman to hold a seat of power. And it's true. This is the same thing they were telling Viserys when he was alive and wanted to name Rhaenyra as his heir. This is the same thing Rhaenys told Rhaenyra after she got named heir and was just trying to look out. It's the same thing Otto's been telling his family and Viserys too. So they feel justified in their assertion of the throne. We did switch to see Alan's brother watching Baylor ride off on Storm Chaser and heading to King's Landing. We did switch to see that the king decided to let his frustrations out on the staff after all by killing all of the rat exterminators that were in his employ. Yo. 
Otto is furious and starts mouthing off on Aegon with Sir Crispy Kristen getting froggy and stepping up to Otto. Otto ignores it and continues giving Aegon some of the most sophisticated insults I've heard on TV in a while. He's feckless. <laughs> Otto goes from 9 to 10 when Aegon brags that Kristen sent Arik as an assassin to kill Rhaenyra. <laughs> And then Otto gets upset and says something slick when he sasses at Aegon for still thinking that Viserys actually named him king. And that right there, that right there. You're watching when keeping it real goes wrong. That's when everything goes downhill for Otto and Aegon is tired of this old dude. And like, we can see Sir Laris's hand up Aegon's ass like a puppet when we hear him say, you were my father's hand and instructs him to give it to Sir Kristen. Otto chucks the symbol at Kristen and just dips. We then switch to see Missera and Rhaenyra coming to an agreement and allowing her her freedom. We then see Missera ready to board the last ship to freedom when she notices Sir Eric among the people heading into the castle and she peeps game quick fast that something ain't right. We then switch to see Eric making his way all throughout Driftmark until he finally finds Rhaenyra and he does try to take her out. Thankfully, she gets saved by his twin brother, Eric, and they have a pretty thrilling sword fight without any of us being able to tell them apart. At least until the bad one kills the good one, but it really doesn't matter either way because at this point, the bad one feels so guilty for what he did that he kills himself. And dang. This is what I'm talking about with twins, right? You can't be or have twins on this show. It's just mm, weddings, births, twins. No. We then switch to see Otto telling his daughter that he's leaving town and he's going to Old Town with Allison's other son that we all forgot existed. And he's going to go to Old Town to just cool off after getting fired. Aww. We then see Allison go in the room with Aegon. Right? She she sees that her son really could use his mom, really could use some consolation, really could use some love. She sees this. And instead of consoling her son, she went to go get some dick. And Ed credits. <laughs> like, yo, lots of big moves in this episode. Otto is gone and Sir Kristen is the hand. Sir Crispy Kristen, the top, I mean the hand. And Allison has another son that we forgot all about. And Damon, where'd you go? In full armor. And then flew off. And now your daughter's heading to King's Land and they get shot. Damn. And Rhaenyra. Damn. You're kind of terrible at rolling. Like, you're just being bombarded with a lot of big decisions during these really emotionally challenging times. And it's not going good. I don't know what to say, girl, but you gotta get it together. You already got a little killed with your bad strategy, but now Bale is going to get sent to die too? Damn! Anyway, look, thanks for tuning in, folks. If you like this video, do me a favor, please hit that like button. If you didn't like this video, well, hit it anyway, right? It's not like it bites. And subscribe if you want more breakdowns and laughs. Stay tuned, stay healthy, and remember, winter is always coming. Peace.